Honourable Members, the Speaker. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy blessing upon this parliament, direct and prosper our deliberations, the advancement of thy glory, and the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Acting Prime Minister. Uh, thank, you. thank you very much, Mr Speaker. I inform the House that the Prime Minister will be absent from question time today as he is attending the inauguration of the Indonesian President, uh, Mr Yudhoyono. I will answer questions on behalf of the Prime Minister. The Minister for Foreign Affairs will also be absent today as he is with the Prime Minister in Indonesia. The Minister for Trade will answer questions on his behalf. Questions without notice. Are there any questions? The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Acting Prime Minister, and I refer her to the 78 asylum seekers aboard the Australian customs vessel, the Oceanic Viking, in waters off the coast of Indonesia. And, and, and I also refer her to the fact that under international maritime law, these asylum seekers should immediately have been taken to the nearest safe port, in this case in Indonesia. Can the Acting Prime Minister explain to the House why this has not already happened? Order the Parliamentary Secretary. The Acting Prime Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Opposition Leader for his question. If, uh, before directly dealing with his question, if I can just place a little bit of context on the record here. Uh, of course, uh, we know, Mr Speaker, we live in a world where there is movement of people around the globe. I think we'd all prefer to live in a world where there was no war or no persecution and no one moved. Uh, but the truth is, each year of the last 20 years in this country, people have arrived here by boat. Uh, this happened under the Howard government, for example, from 1999 Business. to 2001, Order. under the, the Howard Prime government. Minister will resume her place. No matter what the provocation, shouting across the table as the manager for opposition business was doing is uncalled for, and I would caution those on my left on the front bench not to also do anything that would provoke. But, as I said, provocation is not a reason for displaying that sort of behaviour. It would be suggested that perhaps, given the nature of some of the concerns that people have, that we should show a degree of respect to each other. The Acting Prime Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And as I was saying, of course, uh, when the Howard government was in office, we saw 12,176 asylum seekers. The Acting Prime Minister receivers. will resume her seat. The member for Mackalla on a point of order. Um, the question is a point of order is, is on relevance in this, to this extent, Mr. Speaker, that the acting prime minister prefaced her remarks by saying, "Before I answer the question," and then proceeded on the uh, course of action she's taking. If she wished to ask for indulgence, she should have done so. Otherwise, I would ask you to refer her to answer the question. The acting prime minister has the call. I will, be, I will listen carefully to her response. She knows that she has to respond to the question, and the acting prime minister has the call. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I am assuming that on this uh, important uh, issue of public policy, that people are interested in the full picture. So I'm making the simple po point that, of course, uh, in each of the last 20 years, we've seen unauthorised arrivals by boat. The manager of opposition business on a point of order. On relevance, Mr. Speaker, the acting prime minister was not uh, assumes wrongly. She assumes wrongly. We want an answer to our specific order question, which is why the 78 asylum seekers. His seat. The manager of opposition business will resume his seat. The manager of opposition business is warned. 
and he is warned for the comments that he made after he was invited to resume his seat and on the way back to the bench. As I said, I will listen carefully to the acting Prime Minister. She is responding to the question. She has the call and she knows of the obligations to respond to the question. The acting Prime Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and I do thank the member for Sturt for confirming that the opposition is not interested in the full context of this complex issue. Clearly, they're just interested in making cheap political points about it. Uh, so to respond to Order. the Leader of the Opposition's uh, question, which has now been placed in the context in which it should be understood by the member for Sturt, can I respond to the Leader of the Opposition's question as follows. The Australian government on the weekend responded to reports of a vessel in distress off the coast of Sumatra in the Indonesian Search and Rescue Area. The Indonesian Search and Rescue Authority is the lead agency and is coordinating the response. The Australian government offered assistance to the government of Indonesia, and this was accepted by the Indonesian Search and Rescue Authority. As part of its efforts to assist in the search and rescue, the HMAS Armidale <coughs> made contact with the vessel and to ensure the safety of the passengers, the people have been taken off the vessel and are on board the Oceanic Viking. Initial indications are that there are 78 passengers on board the vessel in distress, including five women and five young children. The passengers are safe and have no major medical problems. One passenger has a fever and her condition is being monitored. As the vessel was in the Indonesian search and rescue region, Indonesia is the coordinating authority. We are consulting with the Indonesian Search and Rescue Authority about options for bringing the rescued people to a safe place. In doing so, we will follow the letter of the law in relation to this matter. International laws relating to safety of life at sea issues are in place to ensure the safety of everyone who finds themselves in distress at sea. They create a complex set of overlapping obligations that the government is currently assessing with the Indonesian government. At the conclusion of this assessment, we will act in a way entirely consistent with our legal obligations. We will do so, Mr Speaker, because laws associated with the safety of life at sea protect everyone who travels by sea. Those laws specifically protect Australian sailors and merchant mariners who may find themselves in distress on the high seas. Consequently, we will be abiding by the letter of that international law, and we are doing so. The member for Flynn. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the acting Prime Minister. How is the government supporting the Australian economy and employment? The acting Prime Minister. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for his question. And once again, we can tell from the opposition reaction that they're not interested uh, in the full context of supporting Australian jobs. But let me tell you, Australians very much are. And we know the impact of the global recession is still being felt around the globe. Unemployment in the US stands at 9.8% in the European Union area at 9.6 per cent and in the UK at 7.9 per cent. In Canada, it's 8.4 per cent. Australia's unemployment rate dropped slightly to 5.7 per cent in September. More than 40,000 full-time jobs were created in that month. But, Mr Speaker, we need to remind ourselves, and I take this opportunity to remind the House, that thousands of Australians are doing it tough. Unemployment is 1.4 per cent higher today compared with July last year. More than 658,000 Australians are experiencing the bitter times that unemployment brings. Others, of course, are living on short hours in cooperation with their employers to maintain employment. Now, Mr Speaker, it's easy to rattle off statistics, but what we've got to do is look at the individuals involved. Last week I received the Keep Australia, Keep Australia Working report from my parliamentary colleague Senator Mark R. Bibb and Parliamentary Secretary Jason Clare. And their report clearly shows that the global recession is being felt particularly in parts of this country. 
To take one example, Cairns in far north Queensland has had a sharp spike in its regional unemployment rate to 13.8 per cent. To keep Australians in Cairns in the electorate of Leichhardt working, we are investing $138 million in building school infrastructure, another $3.9 million in social and defence housing and $4.3 million in community-based infrastructure. That's helping companies like Cairns-based MetroBuild, which is currently involved in delivering $60 million in school infrastructure projects as part of our education stimulus in North Queensland. Metro Build project administrator John Lee, the voice of a real Australian talking about this, has said Metro Build feels very positive about the impact of the stimulus package. Fifty workers are directly involved in building the $3.2 million Edge Hill State Schools multi purpose hall. In addition, Metro Build is also supporting another 19 subcontractors employing staff in a $200,000 refurbishment of the Coranda State School. Now, it's not just the economy of places like Cairns that have been affected. Of course, we know in rural Victoria, in Shepparton, uh, youth unemployment is currently at 31.9 per cent. Once again, uh, this would have been made worse without the investments of our stimulus package. The Shepparton News reports that more than $10 million of projects started at schools in Greater Shepparton and $32.4 million of new housing approvals have started over the past three months. Greater Shepparton City Council business manager Leanne Mulcahy said the construction boom in Shepparton was amazing and, I quote, we would attribute a lot of that to the stimulus package and the first home buyers grant. She went on to say that they had done computer modelling on the new construction and a direct increase of $19 million in construction creates another 50 jobs. Now, Mr Speaker, during the days of the global recession, we believe that the predominant task of this government is to keep Australians working. I understand the opposition doesn't share that sentiment. Consequently, they guffaw at these good news stories of people being kept in work. But we believe it is vital that during these days we continue to provide economic stimulus and keep Australians working. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is again to the Acting Prime Minister. And I refer her to the government's repeated assertions that the surge in boat arrivals to Australia is due to international push factors and to the fact that the UN High Commission on Refugees reports that the number of refugees has decreased from 9.9 million as at 31 December 2006 to 9.1 million at the end of 2008, and that in the first eight months of this year, UNHCR figures show that the number of asylum applications has declined from the same period last year. And I ask the Acting Prime Minister why is the government trying to trick the Australian people with spin rather than admit its policy failure has rolled out the red carpet to people smugglers? The Acting Prime Minister. Well, uh, Mr Speaker, I, I always find that it's best if public policy debates are informed by a few facts. And so for the Leader of the Opposition, perhaps he might, might like to take notice of the following facts. In 2008, there was an 85 per cent increase in the number of Afghan asylum seekers claiming protection in industrialised countries worldwide. A fact the Leader of the Opposition might, like, might not like to acknowledge, but a fact nevertheless, an 85 per cent increase in the number of Afghan asylum seekers. And at the same time, Sri Lanka has just emerged from decades-long civil war, which cost tens of thousands of lives, uprooted hundreds of thousands of Sri Lankans and left an economic divide between North and South and east and west. There are currently, I've just uh, heard the uh, opposition interject uh, that the war is over. Well, perhaps the member who's just interjected that may like to consider this very sobering and tragic statistic. 
there are currently 250,000 Tamils from the north of Sri Lanka in camps for internally displaced people. The Tamil community in Sri Lanka feels marginalised and the hard work of post-war political reconciliation lies ahead. We understand that Sri Lanka faces an immense challenge in dealing with the legacy of this very bitter conflict. And these are factors motivating people to seek to leave Sri Lanka, sometimes illegally. On the question of uh, the pull factors uh, that the Leader of the Opposition is referring to, they're the accurate statistics of the push factors, the things that are getting people to start moving. On an analysis of the pull factors, perhaps I can refer him to an article in the Sunday Age by the member for Kuyong. Uh, entitled Razor Wire Returns. Now, I'd have to say I don't um, uh, often agree with the member for Koo Yong. In the time I've been in this place since 1998, we've had some spectacular disagreements on the Joint Committee of Public Accounts and Audit and on other matters. Uh, but I would refer the Leader of the Opposition to this article and I'd ask him to reflect on it before he makes further statements about the question of asylum seeking. And the member for Koo Yong says, did refusing to give permanent protection to people found to be genuine refugees deter? Again, no. In the five years before the introduction of temporary protection visas, there were 3,103 boat arrivals. In the five years after, boat arrivals increased to more than 11,000. And to continue quoting the member for Kuyong, did the coalition governments eventually giving the overwhelming majority of temporary protection visa holders' permanent protection lead to a surge of refugees? No. I'd uh, refer the Leader of the Opposition to those words, and they might help him answer the question he's asked. The member for Chisholm. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Will the Treasurer update the House on recent assessment of business and consumer confidence and on and of the economy more generally. The Treasurer. I uh, thank the member for Chisholm for her question because last week we did receive further encouraging news that business and consumer confidence remains strong uh, in the Australian economy. We had the NAB business survey that showed that confidence amongst Australian businesses remained at around levels not seen since 2007. And of course, with the construction industry one of the most confident, reflecting the government's infrastructure stimulus. And of course, consumer confidence has rebounded strongly over recent months, and that is very encouraging as well. The Census Consumer Survey released last week showed that consumer confidence rose 13 percentage points in the September quarter. And of course, we had the Westpac Melbourne Institute Index of Consumer Sentiment, which rose to its highest level since June 2007. So that means consumer confidence in Australia is now almost 50 per cent higher than pre-stimulus levels of October last year. And of course, this compares very favourably to what's occurring internationally. For example, the rebounding consumer confidence in Australia is something like more than double the improvements seen in the UK and the US. And of course, this is noted in the Reserve Bank minutes which are published today that confidence in Australia has held up better and recovered more strongly than elsewhere in the world. Of course, this reflects the fact that stimulus has kept customers going through the door, kept more Australians in work, and that's what's provided this vital boost to confidence. And of course, it has been the fact that uh, Australia grew, particularly in that March quarter which gave a very big boost to consumer confidence and business confidence in Australia, because really what that confirmed was that Australia was defying uh, global economic gravity, and that has been very, very important. And that, of course, has given even further confidence to the Australian people that can see by working together that we can get through the worst global recession in over 75 years. So strong confidence is important. And of course, Australians do understand that the government is gradually unwinding our stimulus. And that is important, that is very important to a sustainable recovery in the face of what is still a challenging environment. 
and you see this reflected in the RBA minutes today. And they note, and I quote, economic prospects for most of the developed world were still uncertain and the possibility of another downturn in some countries could not be ruled out. So that means, as the acting Prime Minister was saying before, is that we must be very cautious as we move forward because there is still an uncertain international environment. And of course, the, the minutes also reflect the approach of the government and the board. The minutes reflect the, fa the fact that the board recognises that fiscal stimulus has already peaked and is beginning to taper away. If I could just quote from the minutes again. Staff estimates suggested that the impact of fiscal policy, including payments to households and other ongoing programs on GDP growth, was likely to have peaked in the June quarter and was now gradually declining. And this, of course, means that monetary policy and fiscal policy are both working together, heading in the same direction through the economic recovery. And this, of course, gives all, Australian, all Australians confidence that we can tackle the challenges ahead. The member for Farrah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Home Affairs, and I refer the Minister to the revelation by the Commissioner of the Australian Federal Police last night in Senate Estimates that a reference to the impact of the government's policy changes on people smuggling was removed from the Australian Federal Police report. Strategic intelligence forecast, transnational criminal trends and threats to Australia before it was sent out to government agencies. Will the minister confirm the advice warned of the risk that the government's policy changes would contribute to an increase in illegal arrivals? And will he inform the House on whose instructions this advice was excised from the Australian Federal Police report? The Minister for Home Affairs. Order. Order. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Can I thank the, Minister, uh, the Shadow Minister for her question? Can I say, however, I am somewhat surprised that she chooses to verbal the Commissioner of the Australian Federal Police, uh, Mr Speaker, because last night, last night in, in estimates, while questioned by Senator Brandis, uh, the Commissioner made very clear uh, that he certainly was not going to go to a classified document, a document, uh, an, an internal classified document that went to operational matters of the Australian Federal Police. And despite the ongoing questioning by Senator Brandis, he made very clear, as is proper, that he would not divulge uh, to either the senator or, the, or indeed the Senate committee, or indeed to ministers of the government. Uh, operational matters, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I can I can confirm I can confirm that the document entitled "Strategic Intelligence Forecast: Transnational Criminal Trends and Threats to Australia" was prepared by the Australian Federal Police, uh, the Australian Federal Police, uh, on the 27th of March 2009. As I've said, Mr. Speaker, this document is highly classified, and and. <laughs> Order. Highly classified, Mr. Speaker, and disseminated internally within the Australian Federal Police. The Co Commissioner Negus also went on to say yesterday that a sanitised version of the document was disseminated externally to a number of Australian government agencies. Mr. Speaker, it is outrageous for the Shadow Minister for Customs, a person who should know better, to verbal the Commissioner of the Australian Federal Police on security matters, Mr. Speaker. As is, as is proper, as is Order. proper, as is proper, Mr. Speaker, such intelligence documents are produced for operational use by the AFP and are not produced as a basis for policy advice to ministers. They guide the operational decisions of the AFP and its partner agencies. And can I say further? He did not affirm or deny any of the comments put to him by Senator Brandis. It would have been improper for him to do so, Mr Speaker, and therefore the Australian Federal Police Commissioner showed himself to be a professional, unlike the Shadow Minister for Customs. Order. Order. 
I inform the House that we have present in the galleries this afternoon the Premier of Tasmania, David Bartlett, and the Deputy Premier, Lara Giddings. On behalf of the House, I extend to them a very warm welcome. The member for Lyons. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, my question is to the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development and Local Government. How is the government uh, investing to improve road and rail infrastructure in Tasmania through national building program? How is this investment being received and have there been other proposals put forward to build infrastructure, particularly on the Midlands Highway? The Minister for Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development and, and Local Government. I thank, uh, I thank the member for his question and I thank the Leader of the National Party for his interjection. The interjection for the benefit of members and the, for the benefit of the Tasmanian Premier was somebody's going to build it at last. <laughs> he was the Minister. He was the Minister for Transport. For 12 years they sat opposite and they did nothing about the Midlands Highway. We come into office, commit $190 million, $164 million of it to the Brighton Bypass, ahead of schedule by six months, and this clown says somebody's going to build it at last. Order. 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 Order the minister. The I minister. withdraw, Mr thank Speaker. I withdraw. Thank the minister. Minister. This, this project. This project, Mr Speaker, will create up to 380 jobs during construction. We're getting on with the job. On with the job, thanks to the fact that we have fine representatives, fine representatives from Tasmania, all five of them, all five of them working in cooperation with the Tasmanian state government. But I'm asked also, I'm asked also about whether there are alternative propositions being put forward, particularly with the Midlands Highway. And of course, I, with other, other cabinet ministers, had the pleasure of being in Tasmania last week. We were there for the community cabinet consulting with the Tasmanian community. And whilst I was there, it was drawn to my attention that uh, the state Liberals have billboards up saying that they would duplicate the entire Midlands Highway. And I had a thought, think to myself, I thought, well, here they are in here day after day, and out there Senator Coonan and, and uh, the Leader of the Opposition and the Shadow Treasurer, all saying they would wind back spending. Remember that? They're going to wind back the stimulus, they're going to wind back infrastructure spending, but here, out there, is a $2 billion commitment. But when you look at the detail, because when you look at the detail, there are two caveats on it. One is they'll duplicate the highway where appropriate. Where appropriate. Well, we're doing that. We're getting on with that. The second caveat is they'll do it, the state Liberals, subject to federal funding. <laughs> subject to federal funding. That's their other, that's their other, uh, that's their other caveat. So, of course, they got, uh, they got the leader of the National Party to travel down to Tasmania on Saturday to, uh, to back up the to back up this strong commitment, this strong commitment by the, uh, by the state Liberals. And, and in, of course, a moment of honest self-analysis, the leader of the National Party said this, anyone who has driven the road would know that it needs upgrading now. This is uh, the person who was, of course, the transport minister in the former government, knows now that this road needs to be upgraded. So, so what, what's their, their profile of spending of this commitment? First thing they did was he said, if we are elected next time, we will then give a commitment of $400 million to fix this, this project that would cost at least $2 billion. But it gets worse because he said it needed to be fixed now, but he said, he said that it would be, would be delivered in the period between 2014-15 to 2024-25. So there's an optimist for you. They can be held to this commitment if they win the election in 2010, and that's going well. If they win in 2013, 
they win in 2016, they win in 2019 and they win in 2022, then they can be held to account for this commitment for, 10 for, for four, $400 million for 20 per cent of the $2 billion. We don't know where the other $1.6 billion is coming from. This is a farce. On this side of the parliament, we're getting on with the job in cooperation with the Tasmanian government of fixing the Midlands Highway right now. Getting on with the job as part of the $800 million, three times, three times what those opposite put into infrastructure in road and rail over a similar period we're putting into Tasmania through the nation building program. I look forward, I look forward to continuing to work with Premier Bartlett on these projects, and I ask the opposition, please get serious. The deputy leader of the opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question Order. is to the acting prime minister. I refer to comments yesterday by the national secretary of the Australian Workers Union, Paul Howes, about the surge in asylum seekers, and I quote: "I think we should put out a red carpet and welcome them with open hands." Mr. Howes also said, and I quote. One man's people smuggler is another man's liberation hero. Given the influence of the AWU in Labor's national conference, will the acting Prime Minister inform the House what input, direct or indirect, Mr House has had into the government's border protection policies? The acting Prime Minister. Uh, Order. Order. The acting Prime Minister. Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I genuinely thank the deputy, deputy leader of the opposition for her question. The answer is none. Uh, matters, matters of policy for government are decided by the government, uh, and in deciding our border protection policies, what we determined to do was to be tough on border protection but to deal with people in a humane yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what in putting to that balance together, Mr Deputy Speaker, we have been very, very focused on dealing with people smuggling. Very focused on dealing with people smuggling. And of course, as we've dealt with people smuggling, uh, we note uh, that despite the claims of the opposition to the contrary, the numbers of people moving around the globe have increased. The numbers of asylum seekers have increased. And I see the shadow minister shaking her head, so I'm going to take her to some basic facts. Some basic facts. According to the UNHCR at the end of 2008, yeah, that was a great take. Order. The acting Prime Minister will resume her seat. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Mr Speaker, the Acting Prime Minister answered the question. She said the AWU had no indirect or direct input into Labor's policies. Therefore, the question has been answered, and I'll ask that she Order. sit down. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition will resume her seat. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition will resume her seat. Order. Order. As speakers have indicated in the past, there is no way that the speaker can actually dictate the way in which questions are answered. The acting prime minister is responding to the question. The acting prime minister has the call. Uh, it will take finer minds than mine, Mr. Speaker, to work out whether that's the worst performance the deputy leader of the opposition has ever had, or whether the Keating Order. quote was the worst performance the deputy leader of the opposition has ever had. I'll leave that to Order. finer minds than mine to try and work out which was the silliest question. But I am assuming, and once again it may be a heroic assumption in relation to members of the opposition, but I am assuming on one of, uh, one of these public policy debates of our time, namely how the world deals with unauthorised people movement, that people in the opposition are interested in the facts. Now, I'm constantly being proved wrong, question by question, interjection by interjection, but in a and I'm told that's right. Uh, in a triumph of hope over experience, I am going to try and inject uh, some, some facts into this debate in the hope 
that maybe the Leader of the Opposition, the Deputy Leader of the Opposition and others might grapple with the facts as they engage in the public debate about asylum seeking and people movement. And fact number one, fact number one dealing with the question of how many people are moving around our globe, the UNHCR tells us that at the end of 2008, the total number of refugees and internally displaced people under its care remains high at roughly 25 million, almost unchanged since 2007. So some sense that there's been a big drop-off here is not right, not right. Then can I say fact number two, and here we go, of course, facts well, don't Prime want to Minister impinge on the opposition's views. Seat. The Acting Prime Minister resume his seat. The Manager of Opposition Business on a point of order. Mr Speaker, as you constantly say, there's only one point of order that deals with answers to questions, and that is relevance. The Deputy Prime Minister was asked a specific question order. about the influence that Paul Howes question has over the border protection member policy. Will resume his seat. The member will resume his seat. The member will resume his seat. The question made reference to comments about surge in asylum seekers. The Acting Prime Minister. Uh, and fact number two, and I will conclude on this because I think it's important. <coughs> fact number two is the government has adopted an approach which is tough on border protection but humane to asylum seekers. And yeah, on yeah. the question of protecting our borders, I know these facts mightn't suit the opposition who's catcalling now, but on, on the question of the facts, since September 2008, 82 disruptions of planned smuggling Order. ventures to Australia by Indonesian National Police involving around 1,497 persons have occurred—82 disruptions. Since September 2008, the AFP has charged 48 people with people smuggling offences under the Migration Act. And of course, we are aware of the detention of the person known as Captain Bram by the Indonesian Navy, who has been involved in people smuggling. This is evidence, of course, that the government is pursuing tough policies to protect our borders whilst dealing with the question of asylum seekers in a humane fashion. The member for Brisbane. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Human Services, Financial Services, Superannuation and Corporate Law. Will the Minister update the House on recent reports into the strength of Australia's financial services sector? What do these reports show and what action has the government taken to improve Australia's competitive position as a regional financial services hub? The Minister for Human Services, Financial Services, Superannuation and Corporate Law. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And it is fair to say that so far Australia has withstood the global financial crisis better than any comparable nation. But there is more to do to make sure that we capitalise on the uh, opportunities provided by our comparative strengths and also to ensure that we continue to outperform the rest of the world. And Mr Speaker, a robust financial services sector is important to that agenda. It's important to ensure that we continue to capitalise on the opportunities that are available so that we have well-paying, highly skilled jobs in the financial services sector and export more of Australia's financial services, uh, Mr. Speaker, which is so important to our economic uh, performance. And the World Economic Forum last week released its Financial Development Report 2009, which gave a significant endorsement of the maturity of Australia's financial markets. And Mr. Speaker, I am very pleased to report to the House that that report marked Australia as second in the world, ahead of the United States, ahead of Hong Kong and Singapore, and ahead of many of our competitors for the maturity of our financial services sector. And importantly, Mr Speaker, in this very tumultuous time, Australia was the only country in the top ten to have improved its performance over the last 12 months. Stability for our financial sector has been very important in this result. Australia's financial services sector has been building on its strengths and building on the quality of our prudential regulation and building on, Mr. Speaker, building on its, its, very good, uh, its very good track record and it's been further supported by the strength of the real economy, further supported by the fact that Australia is the only nation amongst the nations we normally compare ourselves which has not 
gone into a technical recession. And of course, the member for Dixon, Mr. Speaker. The member for Dixon. The member for Dixon. He couldn't. Member for Dixon couldn't even organise a successful surrender of his own seat, Mr. Speaker. And he's giving us evidence. He's giving us advice. Mr. Speaker, we've all heard of Pyrrhic victories. He had a Pyrrhic surrender. The Order. member for to be advised interjects Order. and he's up. Order. The minister has resumed his seat. The member for Dixon on a point of order. On, on a point of order, uh, Mr. Speaker. He may have his Keating suit on today. Order. The but member no for Paul Dixon Keating. will resume his seat. The member for Dixon is warned. The member for Dixon. The member for Dixon is warned. Before order, 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 ministers, ministers, ministers. Before giving the minister the call, I would suggest to him that he would assist if he ignored interjections, and interjectors should learn not to interject and make themselves targets. The Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Paul Keating never ran away from a fight, Mr Speaker. Minister. The, minister the, minister return, Speaker. the Minister will return to the question. Mr Speaker, also important has been Australia's, the Australian Government's response in instituting the wholesale and retail banking guarantee and ensuring the stability of Australia's financial services sector. Now, Mr Speaker, as well as being ranked second overall in these rankings, Australia was also ranked first in the world for low risk of sovereign debt crisis, which is a very important finding, Mr Speaker, which tells the lie to some of the outlandish and opportunistic claims we've heard about the level of Australia's government's debt. First in the world for the lowest risk of sovereign debt crisis, Mr Speaker, and as I say, the only financial sector in the top 10 over the last 12 months to actually improve its performance but there is still a lot more left to do. We need to make sure that Australia doesn't squander these opportunities. We need to make sure, Mr Speaker, that we build on the opportunities. For some time, Mr Speaker, the world's investors will be looking to see who got through this crisis the best. The world's investors will be looking for a safe harbour where prudential regulation is respected and where the financial services and real economy have done well. And, Mr Speaker, we will be making a case that Australia is that nation. That's why we've been taking policy initiatives like reducing our withholding tax from the highest rate in the world to effectively the lowest, to rewriting our tax treatment of managed investment funds and to doing all the, all, all the other things, Mr Speaker, that needed to have been done over the last decade and a half but which weren't done and will continue to do them. And soon we'll be receiving the Johnson report, which was instigated by the government last year on the rec to recommend the next steps to build the, on the work we've already done. So while some in the House may contend that the hard work is all done, while some in the House may contend that it's time to withdraw stimulus and to leave the financial sector on its own and to leave the economy, Mr Speaker, on its own, we say there's more work to be done. We say we won't miss the opportunities to create jobs. We won't miss the opportunities to build a financial services sector in Australia which exports more and creates better, well-paying jobs for Australians. We won't miss the opportunities, Mr Speaker, because that's what the Australian people expect of us. The member for Murray. I thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Acting Prime Minister, and I refer her to a press release she issued on 23 April 2003 when she was Shadow Immigration Spokesman, and I quote her, Another boat on the way? Another policy failure. Given, given 41 boats carrying nearly 2,000 people have arrived in Australian waters since the Rudd government announced its changes to our border protection policies, will the Deputy Prime Minister confirm that by her own criteria, the government's changes to immigration law represent a massive policy failure? The Acting Prime Minister. Thanks. 
Acting Prime Minister, thank, the call. thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I uh, thank the Shadow Minister for her question. And I presume at uh, the bottom of all of this is the opposition's view that it's going to land a major political blow if somehow it can suggest it agrees with me. A very unusual Order. thing for an opposition to seek to get political advantage from agreeing with uh, the Deputy Prime Minister of the alternate political party and the government. But such is the convoluted logic the opposition has got itself into in these desperate days. Uh, can I thank the Shadow Minister Order. for watching uh, the Laurie Oakes interview on Sunday. I'm sure he's very grateful for her coming up in the viewer attendance numbers as well. Uh, and can I say to the Shadow Minister, of course, that one of the things that has been debated through uh, during this nation's various debates, various debates about asylum seeking and refugees is how you deal with the push factors that get people on the move and what one should do in relation to domestic policy settings. What we would say to the Shadow Minister, what I would say to the Shadow Minister, and I take her again to some inconvenient facts for her, but things I think she should be recognising in this debate. The uh, statistics for from UNHCR about the number of people on the move and the number of people looking for asylum. Order. The Acting Prime Minister will resume his seat. The Member for Murray on a point of order. Yes, obviously it's about relevance, Mr. Speaker. The question was the about for Murray policy will failure resume her being seat. related. The member for Murray will resume her seat. The acting prime minister has the call. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I know that uh, you know Pavlov's dog style that as soon as I say the word fact, someone needs to move a point of order from the opposition <laughs> because they don't want people to know the facts of this debate. And the UNHCR facts are as follows. Asylum seeker call. applications have increased by 28 per cent, and the number of refugees returning home voluntarily decreased by 17 per cent compared to the previous year. Clearly, from those statistics from UNHCR, push factors are on the rise. And on the question of assessing domestic policy settings and the implications of those domestic policy settings on the number of arrivals, I refer her to the analysis of her own colleague, the member for Kuyong, and maybe when question time is at its conclusion, she could go and have a cup of tea with him and talk this through in detail. But, uh, but the shadow minister, I think, would have to acknowledge this that in the five years these are the words of the member for Kuyong, in the five years before the introduction of temporary protection visas there were 3103 boat arrivals in the five years after boat arrivals increased to more than 11000 with statistics like those how does the shadow minister put the case that this government moving away from the TPV system has made a difference to boat arrivals when those statistics tell a story which is the complete reverse. What I'd like the Shadow Minister to acknowledge, what her colleague, the member for Kuyong, acknowledges, what the UNHCR is chronicling for us is, of course, there are factors that get people on the move. The significant factor in our region at the moment is the aftermath of the civil war in Sri Lanka, and no amount of manipulation of the truth by the shadow minister or the leader of the opposition is going to wish that fact away. Before giving the call to the member for Bendigo, I simply say to the member for Barara, as the father of the House, that I know that he knows better than to be interjecting, and I expect to him to show some self-discipline. The member for Bendigo. Speaker, my question is for the Treasurer. Will the Treasurer outline for the House why it is so vital that the Carbon Pollution Reduction Scheme be voted on this year and implemented in the most fiscally responsible way? The Treasurer. I thank the member for Bendigo for his question because climate change is one of the most significant economic challenges that our nation faces, and it is, through the introduction Order. of the CPRS, one of the most significant structural changes that we've seen in this country since the reforms of the Hawke and Keating governments in the early 1980s and 1990s. And of course, that means that we do need an informed debate and informed discussion. And it also means we need some timely action, because this has been talked about for a long time. 
and the government has been working on our proposals for a CPRS since the very beginning of this government, Mr. Speaker. So early passage of the CPRS is necessary, and it's most particularly necessary to give business the investment certainty that they crave and need to support jobs in our economy in the years ahead. And this is the view of the business community. If I could just quote, for example, from the Australian Institute of Superannuation Trustees, they had this to say a month or so ago. The passage of legislation will provide a clear signal and measure of certainty around which long-term institutional investors like super funds can begin to base investment planning and decisions. And of course, this view is shared widely across the business community, and that is why we do welcome, uh, we do welcome the engagement from the opposition at last this week, because we are very serious about considering these proposals. And of course, in responding to their proposals, we will be guided by the national interest. And it means that any of the amendments they put forward must be economically responsible, and they must, of course, be also environmentally credible. Economic responsibility is crucial, and it's crucial, Mr. Speaker, because as we move through this transition in Australian industry and jobs, we have to be very much acutely aware of the need for medium-term fiscal sustainability. The 2009-10 budget presented projections of the underlying cash balance and net debt position out to 2019-2020, and of course, estimates are there of revenue and, spe and spending under the CPRS. They were all accounted for in those projections. And of course, this does mean that any additional spending, which will increase projected deficits and increase net debt, will have to be met by offsets or savings elsewhere. And of course, I think the opposition has confirmed overnight that they have calculated the economic cost and the emissions effect of their amendments. And we certainly look forward to seeing all of that detail from the shadow minister and supplying that as part of the negotiations, because we do want a sensible discussion about costs and benefits, and of course we do want that within a sensible time frame, because we need to have this voted on this year. The House will have plenty of time and the Senate will have plenty of time, because the passage of the CPRS by the end of the year must provide the investment certainty that business has been looking for for such a long period of time. We need those investments now, we need them to support the green jobs of the future, and we need to process and deliberate and act on this important issue this year. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. And I refer the Treasurer to today's Reserve Bank Board Minutes uh, on the decision of 6 October to raise interest rates. The minutes state, and I quote, the balance of risks was now such that the current very expansionary setting of policy was no longer necessary and possibly imprudent. Isn't it the case, Treasurer, that the current very expansionary setting of fiscal policy is also no longer necessary and possibly imprudent? The Treasurer. Well, talk about verbaling the Reserve Bank Board and their minutes, Mr Speaker. I mean, there they go again. They can't stand the fact that the stimulus was successful. They can't stand the fact that the stewardship of this government during a period of grave threat to this country was successful. They simply can't stand it, so they will stretch any fact. They will distort any quote from anybody any time to completely and inaccurately portray the position of both the Governor of the Reserve Bank and the Minister. Order the Treasurer resume his seat. The Leader of the Opposition on a point of order. Yeah, Mr Speaker, I seek leave to tender the Reserve Bank Minute. The table, I should say, yes. Order. Should be. Very yes. good. Order. good point. I well, seek leave to order. table. Order the Leader of the Opposition. Order the Leader of the Opposition will resume his seat. The Leader of the, the, leader of the Opposition will resume his seat. The, order. Order. Whilst Order. The House will come to order. Whilst it's abnormal, I will seek assistance of those on my right. Is leave granted? He's leave not in court now, Mr. Speaker. No. The Treasurer has the call. <laughs> <laughs> Your Honour, the 
are about to hear. Treasurer, Treasurer, if the Treasurer, Treasurer Bank, is responding to the question. Treasurer. The Reserve Bank and the Governor and in their minutes today are saying nothing different from what they have consistently said for a long period of time, and that is that interest rates at their 50-year emergency lows could not stay there forever. And those opposite have been running around the country trying to pretend that somehow they could and that there wouldn't be a withdrawal of monetary policy stimulus by the Reserve Bank at any time in the future. They hate the fact that our economy has begun to grow. They simply dislike that because the one thing that they wanted when they came into this parliament in February this year and voted against our nation building and jobs plan was they wanted higher unemployment. And they wanted it for base political purposes, Mr. Speaker. And they therefore resent the fact that our economic stimulus, working hand in glove, our fiscal stimulus, working hand in glove with the monetary policy stimulus from the Reserve Bank, has produced one of the most outstanding results in the world. That's what they resent. And therefore they then go on to perpetrate a fiction that there is somehow some conflict between the Reserve Bank governor and the board end their minutes with government policy. There is nothing in these minutes that says anything other than the Reserve Bank is beginning, beginning to unwind monetary policy stimulus because the economy is beginning to grow. It is that simple. And of course, fiscal policy, fiscal policy and monetary policy, fiscal policy and monetary policy are both working together. And the other thing the other thing that they refuse to admit is the fact that fiscal policy oh, has, re has reached its Member peak in Casey. June this year. Fiscal policy has reached its peak in Member June next Casey. year, and it will subtract Member from Casey. growth in every quarter of next year. And the reason oh, they no. won't admit that is that they've got a policy the Treasurer of withdrawing. Seat. The manager of opposition business on a Point of order. Mr Speaker, understanding Order 90, the Treasurer has accused the Opposition of distorting the minutes of the Reserve Bank order. and I invite him no to prove where that is the there case is no or There is no point apologize. of order. The member for Sturt will resume his seat. There is no point of order. The Treasurer is responding to the question. Mr. The Treasurer. Mr. Speaker, the Reserve Bo Bank Board minutes do not say that the fiscal policy of the government is imprudent. And in trying to perpetrate that, in trying to perpetrate that, he was continuing the lie in this parliament that somehow there is an impact. Order. The treasurer resume his seat. The leader of the opposition on a point of order. Mr. Speaker, the treasurer has accused me of verbaling the Reserve Bank. He's now accused me of lying about the minutes. I have quoted expressly from the Reserve Bank minutes. Order. They the speak for leader themselves. Of the opposition will resume his seat. The Leader of the Opposition will resume his seat. Order. The, order. the question was in order. The Treasurer is responding to the question. If there have been other grievances If there have been other grievances about the way in which words are, have been misinterpreted or misread into the record and a member feels aggrieved, there are other forms of the House that can be used. The Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, a, to accuse somebody of verbaling another is to accuse them of having fabricated a statement. That's what a verbal is. Verbaling someone is making order. up a the false statement about order. what they've said. I have quoted expressly the from the, the Reserve Bank. will resume his seat. I have suggested the course of action. I didn't. Order. The Manager of Opposition Business on a point of order. With due respect to you, Mr Speaker, as you well know, a member who feels that they have been uh, treated offensively has the right to ask for a withdrawal. The Treasurer, on four occasions before today, has accused us of voting a certain way in this House when the opposite is true. Now today he is accusing the Leader of the Opposition of verbaling the Reserve Bank minutes. He is therefore a serial offender. I would ask you to ask him to withdraw for the good of the House.
One of the standards might be to listen to the standing orders and not interject on everything, every matter. I just remind the member for Bowman of that. <laughs> Regrettably, this is a discourse that is characteristic of this place where people can place greater emphasis on what might be considered as debating points and the like. We have already had in this question time another shadow minister being accused of verbaling. Now, if that was the case, then it would have been raised at that point in time. I am suggesting, I am suggesting that the other forms of the House are the best way that this might be handled. On the point that has been raised further by the manager of opposition business about where there is a necessity repeatedly to make personal explanations, this again is something that has occurred over a number of parliaments. Sorry, the member for McCullough is seeking the call. If I were to seek the call, Mr. Speaker, I would stand and seek it. Well, the, well as I indicated to the Ms. member for Bowman, that if we really were wanting, perhaps, to set some further standards of a better nature to this House, that interjecting, especially on the chair, no matter what people might think of the occupant, might be of assistance. But I am indicating that this point that the manager of opposition business raised in his contribution has been a point that has vexed the House for some time, where members have repeatedly had to make the same personal explanation. The Treasurer has the call, and he will, I hope, conclude his answer. Certainly. Uh, the Leader of the Opposition was talking about the Reserve Bank Board minutes. I would just like to quote uh, from those minutes to conclude my answer, Mr Speaker. And the Board observes that stimulus has already peaked and is tapering away, and it says this. It says staff estimates suggested that the impact of fiscal policy, including payments to households and other ongoing programs on GDP growth, was likely to have peaked in the June quarter and was now gradually declining. And of course, this should be read in the context of statements that the Reserve Bank Governor gave when he attended the Senate inquiry last month, and he was talking about the inbuilt withdrawal of the stimulus. And he had this to say: "Such an outcome would mean that fiscal and monetary policy would be acting broadly consistently, as they did when they were moved in the expansionary direction when the economy was slowing." So the fact is that the RBA is withdrawing uh, monetary policy stimulus. Mr Speaker, the government is withdrawing fiscal policy stimulus and both are working together. The member for Leichhardt. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Defence, Personnel, Material and Science and the Minister assisting the Minister for Climate Change. Why is it vitally important that Australia acts now on climate change in an environmentally and economically responsible way? The Minister assisting the Minister for Climate Change. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the uh, member for Leichhardt for the question. Of course, uh, representing that area of far north Queensland, he knows uh, very well the threat that climate change represents to great environmental icons like the Great Barrier Reef. And of course, it's to meet that environmental threat that the government is proposing to make this major environmental and economic reform, because the scientific consensus uh, Mr Speaker, is very clear, and that is that the impact indeed of unabated climate change will be significant and costly to many countries, and in particular this country. Now, the global community is, of course, meeting Mr Speaker in Copenhagen in December to address this issue that is less than 50 days away, and the government has committed Australia to playing its part constructively to endeavour to achieve an international agreement. Now, as the uh, member for Warringah opined yesterday in the opinion pages of The Australian, passing the CPRS before Copenhagen will assist the international negotiations. Now, the CPRS will enable Australia 
to meet its emissions reduction targets in the most economically efficient way. And it is important that we pass the CPRS, as the Treasurer was indicating to the House earlier, not only to start reducing our greenhouse gas emissions, but also to begin the transformation of our economy and to provide the certainty that is needed for the business community to go on and invest. As I indicated yesterday, the government welcomes the opposition's proposals, and we certainly look forward to seeing detailed written amendments and costings in the very near future. And of course, the government is committed to negotiating in good faith with the opposition in relation to these issues. And the government's job, Mr. Speaker, in these discussions, of course, is to ensure that the scheme will still add up, and that is that it tackles climate change effectively at the lowest cost to our economy, that it is environmentally credible and fiscally responsible. And therefore, it is critical that the coalition's proposals meet both of those criteria also, fiscal responsibility and environmental credibility. Now, whilst the opposition has stated that their proposals will be cost neutral and capable of achieving the same level of emissions reductions as the CPRS, we need to see the detail. Proposals to exclude sectors or to provide them additional support, additional support to particular industries, of course, potentially impose significant additional costs, and they need to be balanced with the need to ensure environmental uh, credibility and the fiscal integrity of the scheme. And the government remains absolutely committed to passing this important legislation. There are therefore, Mr. Speaker, three important criteria by which the government will approach these negotiations and assess the proposals of the coalition. And they are, of course, as I've emphasised, that the proposals are environmentally credible, that they are fiscally responsible, and also that the coalition commit to voting on the timetable that we set on this legislation this year in advance of the Copenhagen conference. These will be the fundamental criteria by which the government approaches these important negotiations. The member for Cook. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Treasurer. I refer the Treasurer to the recent statement by the Reserve Bank Governor, and I quote, the downside risks to which the board was responding earlier this year have not materialised, end of quote. Treasurer, given that this is the case and that the Reserve Bank is now increasing interest rates, why is the government continuing to pursue their record spending, which will only put further pressure on interest rates, especially for the more than 200,000 Australians they have just convinced to buy a new home? The Treasurer. Well, of course, Mr. Speaker, the question is based on a fundamental uh, uh, miscalculation, a fundamental misrepresentation and a fundamental uh, lack of judgment by all of those opposite. The fact is that both fiscal policy and monetary policy are both working and going in the same direction, just as they did when we were responding to the crisis as the economy has begun to grow. Uh, monetary policy is gradually going to be withdrawn. The Treasurer will resume his seat. The member for Cook on a point of order. On, on relevance, Mr. Speaker, I made reference to interest rates increasing order. The member for and Cook increased will spending. His seat. The member for Cook will resume his seat. The Treasurer is responding to the question. Is it the uh, Shadow Minister's proposition that interest rates at 50 year lows could remain there forever? Is that the proposition he's putting forward? Yes or no? Is that the proposition you're putting forward? That it I think the Australian people have a lot more common sense when it comes to this issue than those who are sitting opposite. They understand, they understand that interest rates could not stay at 50-year lows forever. They absolutely understand that. They understand that adjustments will be made. And they also understand that the government put in place our economic stimulus at a time when this country was in dire need and under threat from a global financial crisis and a global recession. And the consequence of that has been the best performance of any advanced economy. The best performance of any advanced economy. And that's really what gets up their nose. That in this situation the government has been effective and the government has been competent. And the government has put to the forefront of all of its actions, protecting the jobs, 
the families and the small businesses of this country. And to score a political point, to score a political point because they voted against that, because they have been so embarrassed about it, they have now been calling for the complete withdrawal of all fiscal stimulus. That's the proposition that they have been putting forward. That is the proposition that they have been putting forward, which would push unemployment back through the roof. Now, if he really believes what he said, what he's really saying is, what he's really saying is, he's in favour of putting builders and tradies out of work. That's where, that's where they are, Mr. Speaker. Order. The treasurer resume his seat. The member for Cook on a point of order. On, on relevance, Mr. Speaker, my simple question was. Why are you continuing to pursue Order. the record spending? The member, for Cook Future will, tense. the member for Cook will resume his seat. Order. The Treasurer is responding to the question. Mr Speaker, the uh, economic stimulus that we put in place responsibly has had its peak impact in the June quarter of this year. And each quarter after June, it is withdrawn. For every quarter of next year, it subtracts from growth. So the economic stimulus is being withdrawn. It was designed to have its maximum impact at the time that it was really required in our hour of need. And of course, that was in February this year, when those opposite walked into the parliament and voted against the nation building and jobs plan, one of the most effective economic stimuluses put in place by any government anywhere in the world. And following the, the advice of the International Monetary Fund and others, we said it would be timely, it would be temporary and it would be targeted. And we designed, we designed it to be gradually withdrawn so that as the private sector gradually recovered, the public sector would gradually withdraw. And that is how it has well, been and that is how it has been done and how it has been designed. Now the Shadow Minister just interjected I want every builder in the country to know what he just said. We're crowding them out. That's what he said. He's pretending there is no spare capacity in Australia's construction industry. This is unbelievable. How out of touch are this mob? How out of touch is their housing minister who's in here pretending there is no spare capacity in the Australian construction industry? I mean, how out of touch can they all be? They simply do not walk in the same shopping aisles as the average Australian. Now we understand, oh, we understand that there Bowman. is a need to continue to provide some support because there is spare capacity in the Australian economy and because unemployment will continue to rise. We understand that many people out there, although they are employed, are working far less hours than they would like to work. And in fact, if you add up all of those reduced hours, that adds up to something like 200,000 full-time jobs, yeah. over and above the increase in unemployment that's occurred in this country that the Acting Prime Minister was talking about earlier. So there is still substantial spare capacity in the Australian economy, which, it, which is why it does require support. But it is also why, as the private sector growth returns, then the monetary policy response from the Reserve Bank will be wound down, as indeed our fiscal stimulus was designed to be wound down. But they want to continue the fiction, which no one in Australia believes and which demonstrates just how incompetent they are and it demonstrates how unfit for government they are that they could walk into this House and claim that interest rates could stay at 50-year lows forever and to pretend that they're not 4 per cent below the peak that they were only a short time ago. And that has, of course, been an enormous benefit to an enormous number of people in this community. But what we have to do is sensibly manage the recovery. And that is what we are doing. And that is why we designed the economic stimulus, the fiscal stimulus, the way we did, to support Australian families, to support employment, to support vulnerable sectors of the economy until private demand returned. And the, and the acting Prime Minister before referred to the fact that the outlook internationally is uncertain. So in the middle of this, we have to be very careful in the way in which we manage the recovery, in the way in which we withdraw our stimulus and the way in which we continue to support the economy because the li livelihoods of tens of thousands of families and businesses depend upon it. It's a pity that those opposite don't realise that. Yeah. The member for Karangamite. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for the Environment, Heritage and the Arts. Will the Minister outline the importance of growing clean energy jobs and transforming Australia's economy for a low carbon future? How is the government's comprehensive approach to tackling climate change helping unlock those opportunities? The Minister for Environment, Heritage and the Arts. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And I thank the member for Karangamite for his question. And it is the case that there are significant opportunities in growing clean energy jobs and securing uh, a low carbon future for Australia. And this is a very important time for Australia to take those opportunities. And, Mr Speaker, the Carbon Pollution Reduction Scheme will play a central role in unlocking these opportunities for clean energy jobs and for industries. It will provide certainty for business, accelerating the competitiveness of clean energy technologies, and that's quite critical at this time when we want to address dangerous climate change. Uh, alongside the CPRS, Mr Speaker, the government's bringing forward comprehensive programs to improve Australia's energy efficiency, growing clean energy jobs for the future through the Energy Efficient Homes Package, providing insulation or solar hot water for more than 500,000 Australian households since February this year. That's right, more than 500,000 Australian households since February this year. And Mr Speaker, this compares to around 4,000 solar hot water rebate applications received over the time of the previous government, and they did nothing on insulation. So, Mr Speaker, we have more than half a million households in eight months compared to 4,000 households in 12 years, and this is about creating jobs. And Mr Speaker, the Insulation Council of Australia and New Zealand, ICANS, originally estimated that around 4,000 jobs would be created as a direct result of the insulation program. The, the council then went on to double that estimate, and they now advise my department that even that doubling figure may be conservative as many more jobs have been created. Through the Solar Homes and Communities Plan, we're on track to help over 120,000 homes install solar systems since November 2007. And again, that compares, uh, in the life of the former government, to around 10,500 solar panels funded over some 12 years. So I think the figures are telling the story. But importantly, Mr Speaker, I'm advised that there are already around 500 additional solar panel installers in training to meet this unprecedented workload, with around 75 new installers becoming accredited each month. And this comes on top of the government's solar credit scheme, part of the expanded renewable energy target. Industry estimates that target will drive around $20 billion of investment in renewable energy technologies. Clean energy jobs delivered by the Rudd government, jobs in insulation, jobs in solar hot water, jobs in solar panels, jobs in large-scale renewables. And Mr Speaker, I can't help but notice that not everyone in the parliament is interested in the task of supporting clean energy technologies and Australian jobs. The member for Tangy has been interjecting ever since I got to my feet. So I was glad that I glanced the report of a speech from the member of Tangy to a group of climate change sceptics, and he wasn't speaking to the opposition backbench, although there are climate change sceptics there. And I'm always interested to see what the member has to say, and I know the opposition leader would be interested in this as well, because this is where the intellectual driving force of the Liberal Party on climate change policy is coming from. And, 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 Mr. Speaker, and, Mr Speaker, according to the report, the member believes that action on climate change is an attempt to overthrow democracy. This is what he said, and I quote. The member is still interjecting, so I'm, I, I want to read his quote out. We have observed anti-democratic comments from many so-called environmentalists calling for the overthrow of democracy and or capitalism to save the planet. Now, Mr Speaker, this is the public policy rigour of the Liberal and National parties when we're at the threshold of one of the most important debates that this country has ever had. He talks about the overthrow of capitalism, Mr Speaker. Regrettably, it's the overthrow of reason. That's the problem that we face here, and I suspect, I suspect the member for Tangy calling it the overthrow of capitalism would surprise the many hard-working Australian families who are now in the process of wanting to build clean energy industries with the assistance of the Rudd government's programs. That's the tradies, 
that's the truck drivers, that's those people along the supply chain, that's the many, many clean energy jobs that the government is actually delivering with our programs. And as for the overthrow of democracy, Mr Speaker, that the member refers to, I can only th think of all those Australians who voted on November 2007 to bring an end to 12 years of denial and climate change scepticism on the part of the Liberal National Parties, now led by the opposition leader, and to, and to provide a clear message from the Australian public that they wanted a government that was going to be serious about tackling climate change and bringing forward the benefits and the fruits of employment to the Australian economy that our policies are already delivering. The member for Riverina. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for the Environment, Heritage and the Arts. Minister, I refer you to the public comments made recently by the CEO of New South Wales. I'm really interested in what he says. Order. I will recommence, Mr Speaker. Order. The member for Riverina has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I refer the minister to public comments made recently by the CEO of New South Wales Irrigators Council, Andrew Gregson, who questioned if the government's $300 million irrigation efficiency program is deliberately designed to fail because of the incredibly tight deadline of six weeks for applications to be submitted. Minister, after two years of delay by your government, will you now, on behalf of the government, give a guarantee that if the $300 million is not fully utilised because of this unrealistic application time frame of just six weeks, that the funding will be allocated to on-farm efficiency projects and not, and not incorporated into further water buybacks, and I actually write my own. The Minister for the Environment, Heritage and the Arts. Order. Well, Mr. 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 Speaker, I thank, I thank the member for her question, and I would say that the guidelines and the timelines that have been set out by the government, there's an expectation that that can be completed by all those parties in a manner that's appropriate to the policy, to the policy delivery that we have sought on this issue. And, and Mr. Speaker, I know that the minister responsible has been particularly assiduous in wanting to drive reform after a 12-year hiatus of reform in the, this question of delivery for water in the Murray-Darling Basin and right through uh, where we are actually concerned about not only providing reform but enabling the very significant challenges that we face, the challenges of drought, the challenges of water shortage and the like, to be resolved. But, Mr Speaker, it is important to note that the minister has made it clear that she is frustrated with some of the pace of reform, and there's no secret about that. And she's made it clear that she's frustrated with some of the pace of reform that's taking place within the state jurisdictions. And you're quoting a CEO from a state body, but I think it's important for me to put that on the record. And the most important thing that the minister has said is that she's concerned about roadblocks, she's concerned about impediments and delays. I don't think she wants to delay the reform process any longer. In fact, I know that she doesn't. And I just make uh, the House aware, uh, through you, Mr Speaker, that jointly with the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, that department is now conducting an audit into the status of a number of projects across the basin. At the end of the day, though, Mr Speaker, I think it's worthwhile saying this through you to the people of Australia as well as to the opposition. This is clearly a difficult and a issue which will require a fair amount of application by us to ensure that the right policy measures are in place. And we can't make it rain, Mr. Speaker. Although I was pleased to see Wimmera farmers are responding, responding to the fact that they uh, think that they've got some, they think that they've got some opportunities for their crops because we have seen some decent winter rain. But at the end of the day, we're committed to reform. We want to see that reform through, uh, and we won't resolve from that task. Order. The minister has concluded. The. Order. The member for Riverina has tested the patience of the chair today. The member for Robertson. Thank you. My question is to the Minister for Families, Housing, Community Services and Indigenous Affairs. As this week is National Carers Week, how is the government improving support for carers? The Minister for Families, Housing, Community Services and Indigenous Affairs. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for Robertson for her question and all of her hard work on behalf of carers in her electorate. Uh, the member for Robertson is right. This week is Carers Week, and it's an opportunity for all of us. In fact, an opportunity for all Australians to take time to recognise and thank the hundreds of thousands of carers right across Australia who do such a wonderful job caring for people that they love, whether it's mums and dads, sons and daughters, grandparents, many, many people who do such an extraordinary job. And for many of them, it's uh, a seven-day-a-week, 24-hour-a-day job. Of course, we know, all of us know, that this does take a very, very significant toll on carers, emotionally, financially, and often uh, a significant physical toll as well. We have, uh, as a government, made carers a priority. And just yesterday, at the launch of Carers Week, I announced that the government does intend to introduce a national carers recognition framework. And this has been something which carers have been calling for for some time. The framework will recognise in legislation the role played by carers. And one of the things that is very important is that uh, it makes sure that all of us uh, understand and recognise through national legislation the commitment and dedication of so many people who do care in so many different circumstances. Of course, uh, it is important for us to recognise, but we've made clear that we understand the need for financial support as well. And as part of our uh, major program of reform of the pension, we've just delivered uh, a very significant increase uh, in carer payment, and that has support, increased support to more than 140,000 carers across the country who are on carer payment. And those uh, carers who are on the maximum rate of the uh, carer payment, those who are on uh, the single rate, will receive increases of just over $70 a fortnight. So uh, a very significant uh, improvement for those uh, carers who are on the maximum rate of the uh, single carer payment. In addition, of course, we have introduced for the first time an ongoing carer supplement, so the carers, uh, whether they're on the carer payment or on the carer allowance, can know with certainty that each year they will get a $600 payment for each of the people that they care for. Uh, I, of course, have had uh, a number of letters from uh, carers uh, indicating how important these measures have been for them. Just uh, to quote one carer indicating to me how important, uh, as she said in her letter, both the gesture and the dollars have been a big help to them meeting their ongoing expenses. And finally, Mr Speaker, I just draw the House's attention to the very significant changes we've made to carer payment child. This is a payment made to carers who are looking after severely disabled children or children with serious medical conditions. Up until uh, the 1st of July, the rules for carer payment child were extremely complicated and restrictive. And we do expect, as a result of these changes, that around 19,000 extra carers of severely disabled children will now be eligible for carer payment child. These are very significant changes which the government has made. We'll continue to work hard with those who represent carers to do everything we can to support people who are doing such a wonderful job. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the member for Warringah. On Mr. A point of order. Mr Speaker, may I seek your indulgence to associate the opposition with the minister's remarks about the importance of carers and to acknowledge not only the good work that the minister has done but also the good work that the former government did in adding $1.3 billion to, pair, to, to carers' bonuses? Yeah, yeah. And now I don't think that the indulgence is required because he's done the job. <laughs> uh, before giving the member for Paterson the um, call, because a statistically uh, significant number of members have brought it to my attention, I inform the House that we have present in the gallery today a former speaker of this place, Steve Martin, and on behalf of members I express to him a warm welcome. The member for Paterson. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Defence Personnel, Material and Science and the Minister assisting the Minister for Climate Change. Is the Minister aware that 10 members of 4 Squadron Royal Australian Air Force who are performing duties in support of the Special Forces have been left at least $20,000 out of pocket despite a CDF directive in June directing that they receive back pay dating back 12 to 24 months? Minister, hasn't the government learned from the SAS pay debacle presided over by the former Minister of Defence and the damage it does to the morale of our serving men and women of our Australian Defence Forces? The Minister for Defence Personnel, Materiel and Science. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank the member for Patterson for his question uh, because it provides an opportunity to outline the specific circumstances of this particular issue. And at the outset, can I make absolutely clear the government's commitment to ensuring that our Order. service personnel and their families receive their correct entitlements. Order, Mr Order, Speaker, Order. the Air Force is currently undertaking the development of a new capability which is known as the Special Tactics Flight within Number 4 Squadron, Order. located or based at RAAF Williamtown. These are Air Force personnel who undertake specific training Order, the to enable them to undertake a range of activities, including operations with special forces. However, they, not, they are not uh, the members of 4 Squadron uh, Special Forces personnel. <coughs> Excuse me. When they are deployed on operations or conducting associated training, they have an entitlement to a component of the Special Forces Disability Allowance. Now, this allowance is paid in recognition of the hazard and stress associated with service within the Special Forces environment that they, of course, experience. Now, Mr Speaker, I am advised that in April, not June, as I think the member for Patterson indicated, this year a directive from the Chief of the Defence Force created this allowance and indicated that the allowance would be paid on an on, on occurrence basis, that is, when the capability is in use or when people are in training. Uh, or in operations, rather than as a continuous payment. At the same time, the CDF also approved the back pay of this entitlement for those deployed or trained prior to April 2009, when the allowance was created. The training began in 2007. When transactions related to this allowance, after its generation in April, were loaded onto the pay system at the end of September 2009, they were incorrectly loaded, I'm advised, at a continuous rate. Now, the first that order, the minister will resume his seat. The member for Patterson on a point of order. Mr. Speaker, if he was their union official rather than their the ministry, he'd call them out and strike on this issue over their the pay. The member for the chamber for one hour under 94A. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Mr. Speaker, I understand that the Air Force, uh, upon the uh, loading of this data onto the pay system, immediately recognised this occurred in September. Immediately recognised that the continuous rate for this allowance did not accord with the original directive from the Chief of the Defence Force, and they stopped the payment. Therefore, the suspension of the payment was designed to ensure that the Special Forces disability allowances were not paid in error, which would have led to the need to recover any overpayments. <coughs> I am further advised that the Air Force Order. is currently in the process of developing the correct business rules for the payment of the allowance and ensuring that all affected members Order. are paid their correct entitlements. Order. I'm Order. Further the Minister resume his seat. The Minister resume his seat. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for O'Connor. Mr. Speaker, I'm advised that currently 18 members of Number Four Squadron are entitled to receive a component of this allowance uh, through their training and/or their operational activity. And uh, today, uh, I've written to the acting chief of the Defence Force uh, to urge urgent resolution of this issue. And finally, Mr. Speaker, could I remark that? Uh, the first that the government was aware of this issue 
uh, was yesterday, and uh, we've taken immediate action to ensure that the that the particular service personnel, that their circumstances are appropriately investigated by the ADF and that their correct entitlements are paid as soon as possible. The member for Deakin. Order, the member for Deakin has the call. Member thank, for Deakin. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Ageing. Will the Minister update the House on the government's reform plans for health, hospitals and aged care? The Minister for Ageing. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for Deakin for his question. Mr. Speaker, the Rudd government is serious about reforming our health, hospitals, and aged care system. In fact, only three months ago, we released the National Health and Hospital Reform Commission report, and since that time, the Prime Minister, the Health Minister, the Minister for Indigenous Health, and the Parliamentary Secretary for Health, and myself have been uh, travelling around the country, road testing the 123 recommendations for reform that were in the Commission's report. And uh, can I say, Mr. Speaker, in fact, last Friday's Warren. consultation, Alice Springs by Minister Snowden, was the government's 60th consultation. That's uh, one consult every one and a half days. Mr. Speaker, we're listening to people at the coalface to get their views. And more than 4,500 people have attended these consultations, and the feedback has been very positive. In fact, aged care providers have been actively engaged in the process recognising the need to build an integrated health and aged care system that meets the needs of our ageing population. Mr Speaker, this government has already taken very concrete steps to meet the challenges of an ageing population. We have uh, provided more funding for aged care services than any previous Australian government, increasing funding to the sector by an average of 9 per cent a year. We have rolled out transition care places to support older people recovering and regaining their independence, keeping them out of hospitals and, in, and keeping them out of early entry into nursing homes. We have also invested in our aged care workforce to improve the quality of care today and for the future. And we are making more information available for consumers, particularly about the performance of individual aged care facilities. And very importantly, Mr Speaker, we have taken a very tough stand to protect our older Australians. Mr Speaker, Australians now have one of the longest life expectancies in the English-speaking world. And, of course, with increased longevity, more people are living with uh, multiple complex and chronic conditions. And the ageing of the population presents substantial challenges, challenges that this government is working hard to meet. Of course, under the previous government, Australians had a decade of neglect in the health and aged care sector. And in contrast, we have a blueprint for reform, and we're out there consulting with the community, discussing that with them. Mr Speaker, we stand on the cusp of the most significant reform to our health system since the introduction of Medicare 25 years ago, and I urge the opposition to support it. The member for Warringah. Thanks, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Families, Housing, Community Services and Indigenous Affairs. I refer the minister to her answer yesterday, in which she claimed that some 230 demountables had been used to provide Aboriginal housing as a justification for using a further 81 demountables for unauthorised arrivals rather than Indigenous Australians, despite the continuing housing crisis in the Alice Spring town camps. Mr Speaker, why didn't the minister admit that those 230 demountables have in fact been used to house visiting professionals rather than local Aboriginal people? So I now ask the minister to provide the names of those communities where these demountables have been used to house local Aborigines as they should have been. The Minister for Families, Housing, Community Services and Indigenous Affairs. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Well, it's extraordinary that he's having another go. He's having another go after yesterday. It was quite Water. clear that when you took all of these demountables to Alice Springs to use them in the Alice Springs town camps, how many did, did they use? No. Zero. Absolutely none. I made it absolutely clear yesterday what we were Water. using the demountables for, and you know what it is, and we know that you used none of them. The member for Ballarat. Order. The member for Ballarat has the call. The member for Warringah. Order. 
The member for Ballarat has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And my question is to the Minister for Health and Ageing. How are the government's plans for GP super clinics progressing, and what is the community's response? The Minister for Health and Ageing. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for Ballarat. Uh, for her question. There's been some particularly good news in Ballarat, which I'll come to in a moment, but actually the most recent government announcement for the newest uh, GP superclinic was in Gunnedah in New South Wales, bringing the total number of superclinics funded to, uh, by the Rudd government to 36. As the member for Parks has uh, welcomed, funding of $4.3 million will now go towards the construction of a new facility, the Gunnedah Rural Health Centre, on the grounds of the hospital. The announcement has been met with uh, delight by the local community, including, as I acknowledge, the member for Parks. The member for Parks called it, and I quote, a great day for the people of Gunnedah, an exciting model and a long-held dream. So I welcome those comments and uh, welcome the recognition from some of those opposite that the GP Super Clinic strategy is delivering and will deliver to local communities. And I just wonder whether the Shadow Minister for Health is changing his view and will now support the Super Clinic strategy. A little bit difficult to tell when we don't know what his health policy is, whether he actually uh, cares about the, of course, Super Clinic in his electorate. He didn't bother to turn up to uh, the sod turning for the Strathpine Super Clinic in Dixon. It must have been that he already knew he was moving to McPherson at that time. But let me, uh, let, let me come back to the member for Ballarat because I was delighted last month to join the member for Ballarat and officially open the first fully operational GP Super Clinic in Balan. Um, and this Super Clinic is really something worth uh, the, this House taking note of. $1.4 million was provided by the government, but the remaining $0.9 uh, million that uh, made up this $2.3 million project was actually raised by funds in the community, and I think we should congratulate the community of Balan for their contribution. The service is going to provide GPs, practice nurses, visiting specialists, allied health services, chronic disease management. And I think of interest to all in this house, for the first time ever, Balan will have its own dental service. For the first time ever, a dentist will be working in Balan in the super clinic, courtesy of this funding arrangement. 26 GP super clinic contracts are now signed. Uh, in addition to the one in Balan, there are five other services that are providing interim services. For example, I can advise, I know the member for Dobell has particularly welcomed this, that the Warner Vale Clinic has started to provide GP services last week for the first time at its interim site podiatry, a diabetes educator, exercise physiologist and pharmacy services are expected to start soon. Given that uh, the member for Dixon wasn't prepared to turn up to the sod turning for his super clinic in Strathpine, and I presume he won't be around for the ribbon cutting clinic because he uh, ribbon cutting ceremony because of course he checked out of Dixon months ago. Interestingly, a member for the Gold Coast is asking when there'll be a super clinic in the Gold Coast. Of course, the shadow minister was trying to move to the Gold Coast, but he was rejected Order. in McPherson. He's not wanted in Rye. He can't decide if he's going to the run minister for concluded? Has the minister concluded? No. The minister resume her seat. The Manager of Opposition Business on a point of order. Obviously, on the point of relevance, Mr. Speaker, the Minister was asked about GP super clinics and is straying very far from the subject. Well, I, un I understand the, and the member's point of order, but the Minister had managed to get herself back on track at the time that you jumped. The Minister will respond to the question. Mr. Speaker, I'm responding to the order. part of the question. Order. I'm responding the to call. the part of the question which deals with the community's response, and yeah. one might expect that the shadow health minister might have a view about GP superclinics, not just as the national spokesperson for the Liberal Party, but as a local member who has a GP superclinic being constructed in his seat, who was not prepared to turn up to the opening ceremony, oh. has not paid any interest in the uh, many jobs that are being provided on site. Uh, I, did, I did notice, though, that uh, he has said and uh, declared the day after the McPherson pre-selection that he wouldn't Order. give up. The minister will resume her seat. The 
Manager of Opposition Business on a point of order. Mr Speaker, I move that the member be no longer heard. The question is that the member be no longer heard. All those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the noes have it. Division required. Division required. Ring the bells. Lock the doors. The question is that the member be no longer heard. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I point the honourable members for Ryan and Riverina tellers for the ayes, and the members for Shortland and Hindmarsh tellers for the noes.
Order. The result of the division is ayes 53, noes 77. The question is therefore negatived. Could members please resume their places quickly, quietly? There seems to be friendly cross-chamber conferencing. It would help if everybody resumed their places. <laughs> the minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The GP Superclinic strategy is going full steam ahead. As I said, we have services now being delivered in many communities across the country. Uh, the longest serving being in Palmerston, where there are many thousands of members of the community who have received after-hours services uh, at the interim superclinic that is uh, servicing that community there. So I say now is the time for the member for Dixon to make a decision about whether he is going to take up an interest in his local superclinic, take up an interest in health policy, take up an interest in Dixon. But in fact, what we've seen is no fight, no policies, and no surprise, no seat. The member for Flinders. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for the Environment, Heritage, and the Arts, and it follows his failure yesterday to deny a meeting in which the government was warned of cost blowouts in the $2.7 billion pink bats cash splash. I refer the minister to these two quotes for insulation for the same unit in Toowoomba. The first quote for an area of three by five metres came in at the maximum government rebate figure of $1,600. The owner decided to get a second quote for the same job. This came in at only $300. <laughs> Minister, doesn't this example confirm that the price hikes resulting from the government's pink bats program are wasting some $900 million of taxpayers' money? The Minister for Environment, Heritage and the Arts. I thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the uh, honourable member for his question. I'm reminded of a question that was asked earlier by the member for Hinkler uh, about a matter relating to uh, the insulation program, where we learned uh, upon the company responsible for that particular matter that, in fact, the points that had been put by way of question in the House were not an accurate reflection of the views that the general manager put to me in the House. And I also reflect, uh, Mr. Speaker that it is this honourable member who jumped out of a plane without a parachute to tell us, to tell us that solar panel installations were in free fall. In free fall. In free fall, this is what we say. When, it, when, when, in, when, in, fact, when in fact they were at all time record highs. When, when in fact they were at all time record highs. But, but Mr Speaker, but Mr Speaker, what I would say. Order. The minister has the call. What I would say, what I would say to the honourable member, is that it is the expectation of the government that installers will ensure that they follow the guidelines that have been laid out in terms of ceiling insulation. And I do say to people that they should take the opportunity to get at least uh, two quotes, if not more, in order to assess the quotation that's been given to them. And I also say to the honourable member that we have an extensively delivered compliance and auditing program. He knows that himself because only a couple of weeks ago he was calling on the Auditor General to come in and to provide some auditing. And he knows that the Auditor General has communicated the fact that the existing audit provisions and plans that are contemplated for this program are sufficient for this point in time. And no, no. Well, I'm, ha I'm happy to speak about it even further. Order the minister resume his seat. The member for Flinders on a point of order. Mr Speaker, on relevance directly on this issue, 
The auditor general indicated the it member was for his Flinders department. Will resume his which seat. Is... The member for Flinders will resume his seat. The member for Flinders is warned. The minister has the call. The shadow minister, as member, the member for Flinders, was calling on the auditor general to take a specific action, which the auditor general deemed was not necessary, and he's communicated that to me. On, on the, the basis me member that, for Flinders has been warned. Yeah, on the basis. On the basis, Mr. Speaker, that the government takes the effective delivery of this program very seriously. Well, we've got a number of measures in place, including compliant and auditing measures. We've got Price Waterhouse Coopers now involved in making sure those compliance and auditing measures are done at a national level and at national scale. And, Mr. Speaker, it is the case that some ceiling installations will cost at least $1,600 and in some instances even more. But the fact is that since February this has been the most comprehensive rollout of an energy efficiency program that we have ever seen in this country. We are delivering the opportunity for families to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions, for energy costs to be reduced and we're employing Australians at the same time. I will make sure that this program continues to deliver the very good benefits that it's bringing to the Australian public. The member for Ford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Small Business, Independent Contractors and the Service Economy. Minister, how is the government providing support for small business and are there any impediments to the delivery of this support? Order. The Minister for Small Business. Order. The Minister has the call. Well, I thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for Ford for his question for reasons which will soon become evident. I launched the uh, Small Business Support Line on the 3rd of September uh, to provide advisory services to small businesses during the global recession. I'm pleased to advise the House, Mr. Speaker, that since the support line became operational, 2,226 calls have been received from small businesses. Now, that support line is being staffed by a team of eight advisers, each with extensive small business experience. Yet again, in criticising the support line, the member for Moncrief has got it wrong. In a press release of the 17th of August, he claims that the small business support line, I quote, will be staffed by bureaucrats and offer none of the tangible help which small businesses need day to day. Well, I can report, Mr. Speaker, that a survey of callers reveals that a 90 per cent satisfaction rate with the, support, support, the small business support line, staffed by small business advisers, extensive small business experience, not bureaucrats, and very, very popular 90 per cent satisfaction. Now, I'm asked about impediments, Mr. Speaker. Asked about impediments uh, to the support line and the government's effort to support small business. Well, the shadow minister for small business is an impediment. Is an impediment to the government's policies. Is it any wonder, Mr. Speaker? Is it any wonder that in the list of the Gold Coast 100 most powerful people, the Gold Coast Bulletin has relegated relegated the member for Moncrief from 46th last year to 93rd, 93rd this year. Now, in explaining the member for Moncrief's demise, the Gold Coast Bulletin says this, Mr. Speaker, and I quote: "Gold Coast Bulletin: Order. The Moncrief MP has taken several hits this year as the coalition struggles to keep pace with PM Kevin Rudd. He is regularly mocked by the, the ALP for failing Minister to ask questions in the seat. chamber." Minister, resume his seat. Minister, resume his seat. Order. The member for Murray on a point of order. Clearly, this is a frolic on his own. This is irrelevant, and the minister the should be Murray serious will about this. His seat. Her seat. The member for Murray will resume his seat. The minister will relate his material to the question. The minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I was asked about impediments to uh, the government's policy, and the member for Moncrief, as the Gold Coast Bulletin has identified him as an impediment. In fact, he is sinking like a stone. I can advise the House, Mr. Speaker. That is now 509 days since the member for Moncrief last asked me a question. And I did thank the member for Ford for his question, and there was an especially good reason for that, because I note that the member for Ford is a bullet performer on the top 100 most influential people on the Gold Coast. On the Gold Coast, entering for the first time at 75 and rising fast, rising fast. And you know what the, uh, the Gold Coast Bulletin says about the member for Ford, about, how he, about his commitment? 
how it's commitment to his area, but the fact is it points out that the member for Ford, his office, is in Beanley. Now, Beanley is in Logan City. Logan City, but it actually says of him, despite his federal seat being pos positioned in Beanley, Mr Raguse has managed to successfully lobby Prime Minister Kevin Rudd on the Gold Coast Rapid Transport System and the AFL Stadium and has secured a community cabinet meeting. So go to the member for Ford. Go to the member for Ford. Order Mr the Speaker, this is the only way of getting him up to the disposal. Member for Moncrief on a point of order. Well, Mr. Order. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, on a matter of relevance, I note that a Logan City representative who actually lives in Logan City makes a stark contrast to the Minister for Order. Uh, Small Business. The member Business. for Moncrief has not got a point of order. The Minister. Ooh. Minister. Ooh. The Minister will respond to the question. You don't attack your own. Well, we've got something to say about the member for Dixon because. Coming in at 77, another bullet performer. First time, Karen Andrews. The 49-year-old emerged from the shadows to beat Liberal Party poster boy Peter Dutton in the McPherson pre-selection battle. Now, the, member, the, the, the new likely member for McPherson, Karen Andrews, is said to have more influence on the Gold Coast than the member for Moncrief. Order. The Minister of Jimmy said the Manager of Opposition Business on a point of order. Mr Speaker, clearly the Minister is not being relevant to the question. He's also making a mockery of question time, and I'd ask you to ask him to sit down. Order. The Minister will bring his answer to a conclusion. I am, Mr Speaker, and in conclusion, danger, 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 Will Robinson over here, Mr Speaker. <laughs> I'm asked what further support the government is providing for small business. Our nation building infrastructure investment is supporting local tradies and apprentices, and small business is taking up the small business tax break with great gusto. But, Mr. Speaker, the global economy remains weak and fragile, and the road to recovery for small business will be a long and bumpy one. But the opposition persists, including today, including today, the Leader of the Opposition calling for the withdrawal of the stimulus, saying isn't it the case that the current very expansionary setting of fiscal policy is also no longer necessary and possibly imprudent? There he is, Major Tom, in outer order, space. There order. he is, the right The minister will resume his seat. The minister way. will resume. The minister has concluded. He will resume his seat. Minister. 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 Will you resume his seat? The I think we know that the acting prime minister is trying to get the call, but I take this is a point of order. So the member for Moncrief. Speaker, uh, I would seek leave to table the release where we talk about labour wasting is two and a half thousand dollars an leave hour is not on your wasted the acting expenditure. Prime minister. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I move that further questions be placed on the notice paper. Uh, and